how to live without fear or without worry all those of you who are worrying about something raise your right hand <laughs> okay. I am so sorry to see so many hands by the end of the sermon if I were to ask that question I should see no hands because God can make changes instantaneously how long did it take God to convert Saul from a murdering persecuting zealot to a child of God how long did that take like that when Jesus comes back this corruptible shall put on incorruption in how much time twinkling of an eye when a man or a woman comes to Christ acknowledges his or her undone condition recognizes the need for a power outside of himself or herself and the urgent need for a savior and the person confesses and says Lord save me how long does it take conversion to occur like that then it continues when Peter was sinking and he said Lord save me how long did it take Jesus to save him like that for some reason we have this mentality that it takes God a long time to change things about us if that is the case it takes God a long time because it takes us a long time to come to the place where we say Lord I want you to do this for me 100% now when we reach that point it does not take God long not long at all and so if you've come in here tonight riddled with worry you should leave released and free Matthew 6 reading from verse 19 Matthew 6 reading from verse 19 for public reading we use or I use the King James Version how many are here for the first time may I see your hands God bless you God bless you God bless you anyone from far away tonight far away where are you from where what did he say Ontario Ontario Canada all right well that's far and we appreciate your sacrifice in making the trip in one day to be here we appreciate that very much anyone else far away where are you from Toronto okay we have some regional friends right there okay yes my good brother Washington Spokane Washington as opposed to Washington DC all right well it's good to have you wherever you're from God's hands are not too short that they cannot save whether you're from Ontario Toronto Spokane or the moon God can reach you and save you somebody say amen yes he can do you have Matthew 6 do you have verse 19 the Bible says lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also let's examine these three verses from the lips of Jesus Christ himself Jesus gives us a choice two choices for the depositing of that which we hold valuable either on earth or in heaven and so he gives us some advice lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt now what are treasures that which is important and valuable to us it can also mean your money it can mean your influence is it an influence that points people heavenward or is it an influence that points people downward which one does God want you and me to exert Jesus says lay up your treasures in heaven because there are no moths there is no rust 
Consequently, there is no corruption. That which we do for God, that which tends to point people towards heaven, there is no corruption possible. And verse 21 tells us, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The heart obviously means the mind. A few years ago, I was preaching in the church of a friend of mine. He's a preacher. Not sure where he is now. And he was telling me a story about a car he had bought. It was top of the line in that particular model or make. I'm not sure what the word is. And he said when his car was parked outside the church on Sabbath mornings, and he's the pastor, he is on the pulpit waiting for his time to preach. And his mind was not on the sermon. He told me his mind dwelt on these questions. Who is parking next to me? Who is looking at my car? Is someone scratching my car? That's where his heart was because all that he was with respect to image was wrapped up in that piece of metal and rubber. He said to me, I decided I had to sell that car. He said, I sold it. I bought another car that allows me to think of other things when I'm on the pulpit. He said, now I don't think who parts next to me when I'm doing God's work. My mind is heavenward, not earthward. Wherever we put that which is valuable to us, that's where our minds are. That's what we worry about. That's what causes anxiety and loss of sleep. And Jesus says, don't do that. That which is most valuable to us, he says, let us lay that up in heaven. Because if that's where our treasure is, that's where our minds will be focused. You see, God who made us understands us. Now, God has nothing against having treasures. Let me say that as clearly as I possibly can. How many of you have ever heard of the book, Councils on Stewardship? Let me see your hands. Hands down. Those of you who've never heard of the book, Councils on Stewardship, raise your hand. All right. A lot of hands. I hope the ABC has enough copies for all of my friends who have never heard of councils on stewardship. Let me give you a statement in that book, page 148, paragraph 2. The writer is a lady called Ellen White. Tremendous woman. Somebody say amen with me. Tremendous woman. Here's what she wrote. And if you buy that book and you read it, you will wonder, who is this woman? Here's what she said. The desire to accumulate wealth is an original impulse of the heart implanted there by our Heavenly Father for noble ends. For me, in that quotation, the key word is noble because noble has nothing to do with you, it has to do with someone else. Noble has nothing to do with me, it has to do with someone else. Let me give you that quotation again as we talk about how to live without fear. The impulse or the desire to accumulate wealth is an original impulse. The word original means it goes back to Eden. Implanted there by our heavenly father for noble ends, noble reasons, noble objectives. And I repeat, a noble objective has nothing to do with me. And if you'll permit the false grammar, with I. It has to do with someone else. So even in an unfallen state, it was God's desire that mankind would meet the needs of others, what other needs unfallen people might have had. So Christ is not against having treasures. All he tells us to do, be careful where you deposit your treasure. Now how do I deposit treasures in heaven? I support the work of God. I see someone in need and I assist because Jesus enunciates a very serious principle inasmuch as he have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Finish it for me. You have done it unto me. That's a deposit in heaven. Because Jesus 
pays his debts. You know what Jesus told the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18? When he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. And Jesus heard that, he said, go, sell all that thou hast and distribute to the poor and thou shalt do what? Have treasure in heaven. Jesus lets us know one way to save up treasure in heaven is to give to people down here. Not one amen. <laughs> a couple more. <laughs> Are we opposed to giving to people? Does not your Bible say it is more blessed to do what? Than to? How many of us believe it? Yes. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, says your Jesus and mine. But lay up for yourselves. Notice, this is not selfishness, but notice the word Christ uses. Lay up for yourselves. There is a place in the Christian life to look out for yourself. Wherefore, beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out somebody else's salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own. There is a place in salvation for looking out for yourself. That is not selfishness. That is making sure that between God and me, there is no obstacle. There are no barriers between God and me. That's looking out for me in the context of God. And so Jesus says, lay up for yourselves. You're a professor in a classroom. Do you know how many people have gone into professions because they were influenced by a teacher? Teachers have tremendous influence on students. Students of any age, you are a Christian professor. You're standing before your class. What is your desire? To impress the students with your knowledge or to exert an influence that saves? Where will you lay up your treasure? Because if that person is saved, that person becomes a living treasure to your account. Where your treasure is, there will your heart, your mind. You see, on the earth, there is anxiety, there is fear, there is worry, there is uncertainty, there is Enron, there are things like that. Jesus says, that's not the place to invest. That does not happen in heaven. There are no crashes of the stock market in heaven there's no depression era in heaven an investment in heaven pays dividends eternally investment on this earth comes to a fiery end do you understand me so jesus says you want your heart on heaven put your treasures in heaven let me make a guess about some of you. There are some people listening to me now who are quite wealthy. I won't ask for a show of hands because you may have a long line of people following you home. There are people listening to me with money to spare. But because they don't like the pastor, the church didn't put down the carpet they wanted. They don't like somebody else they don't like the way the church does evangelism they refuse to give as a punitive response absolutely refuse let me tell you something else this nice lady called ellen white said i don't recall where i read it i read it all the money required to finish the gospel you know where it is in the church why is the gospel not finished all the money or as she used to say all the means required to complete the work that people may go home that sickness may come to an end death disease suffering starvation genocide may come to an end it is in the church you know god is omnipotent but i've learned there's some things he can't do one of the things he can't seem to do is get the money out of his people. Now, money does his. 
Haggai 2.8, all the silver and the gold, mine. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein is his. But we hold on to it with the tenacity of a half-starved pit bull will not let go. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Lay up our treasures by the advice of Jesus Christ in heaven. 7.30, as we continue, how to live without fear. Let's go to verse 22, Matthew 6. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now Jesus is saying, we need or he needs people with eyes that are single. I'm not saying he wants one-eyed people. He's, he wants people who are focused on swervingly you know i've noticed when horses that, that those race horses they wear these things on their eyes and my guess is having never consulted a jockey my guess is that they don't see the horses next to them unless the horse is several furlongs in front of him they don't see what's happening to the right or to the left they just look ahead and jesus says i need people whose eyes are single to my work to my cause and to my glory single let me tell you how i've learned not to worry when i go to preach whenever i can and people tell me, we are considering calling you. I write back and I say, that's nice. Get together a few names of people who could do it even better than I can. Think of some people. Now, pray over those names if the Spirit of God convicts you that I am the one you call me. Too often we invite people because they speak well. We don't care whether they have a relationship with Christ or not. He speaks well, or she speaks well, or she sings well, or he pastors a large church. Those are the bases on which we invite people to speak. No one would have invited John the Baptist on those grounds. So my request always is pray. If you are convicted... Then call me. Now, if that call comes, now I go with no worry, no fear, no concern, because I go with the conviction I am going where God wants me to go. And I know if I need something, somehow God will provide it. If an obstacle arises, God will remove it, because God, when God sends you, He takes care of you. And so when I go, I go on a mission. And people on a mission don't look for luxury. They have one focus, the mission. You know, you men sitting here, you know football. There's, I grew up in the West Indies, we didn't have football. But as I came to the United States, I watched it and I, the thing about football that impresses me most, two things. The running back and the wide receiver two perilous ways to make money I am told because I used to counsel an athlete who won the Heisman Trophy now that's not laying up treasure in heaven I just thought I'd tell you he, he did win the Heisman Trophy in 91 His name is Desmond Howard by the way a fine young man as, and I counsel other players at the University of Michigan who went on to play professional football and they tell me, and I saw, and I heard, when the running back is running, he has the ball. Here's the line right over there. That's the goal line. Now, he is not to concern himself with the fact that a man on this side weighing 300 pounds, and a man on this side weighing about 600, and a man over here coming right in front of him weighing 290, they are all converging on his ribs. He is not to be concerned with that. 
He is to be concerned with getting that ball to break the line, the goal line. Once it breaks the plane, they tell me, that's a touchdown. That's all he is concerned about. And if he is hit, he's not supposed to go down. He is supposed to take the hit. If they hang on to him, he is supposed to carry them. Because he has one mission. His eye is single, break the plane. Now, the wide receiver, they tell me, you must catch the ball with your eyes. And the saying I've heard is, look the ball into your hands. Don't worry about the feet you hear. Have faith. Catch the ball regardless of the man who is coming to separate your head from your neck. And you're not to take your eye off the ball. Now Jesus says, if thine eye be single. How many teams would win games if every time the wide receiver goes up for a catch, he's looking around to see who's coming? And Christians, we must learn to put our eyes on the business of God and not look around. But the world is a past master at distracting us. So we look. Here's the gospel ball. Jesus throws it. He says, catch it. Run with it. And we start to run. And we hear the pitter-patter of fashion. And we turn. Hmm. Like that. The ball is in the air, about to drop. Like that. My next paycheck, I've got to get one. Church building not finished, but that's okay. I've got to get that. All the world comes up with something else. We hear the pitter patter of some other distraction. Whatever it may be. And our eyes leave the ball that Jesus has thrown. And, and Jesus looks for men and women who will get put their eyes on that ball and not take it off. When that becomes your only obsession, you do not worry about what's around you. If thine eye be single to the glory of God, if any man had a reason to look around, it was Jesus going up Calvary. But he kept his eye on the summit of that hill because on the summit of that hill through the eye of faith, he saw all the souls that would be saved by his sacrifice and would not be distracted. Now let's look at verse 24, Matthew 6, as we continue how to live without fear. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. Do you know most people try? Now, Jesus didn't say you should not serve two masters. He did not say that. He announces an absolute impossibility. No man, no woman can serve two masters. It cannot happen. Which means that if I am not serving God, can I finish? Will you still love me? You finish it. Yes, if you are not serving God, you are serving another power. However polite you may be, and calm, and poised, and educated, and well-mannered, and, and, and smooth, and silky, and sophisticated, and suave. That same woman I like to talk about, she said in the book, Great Controversy, may see the hands of those who've never heard of Great Controversy. Raise your hand quickly. Never heard of it. Got to get that young man a copy. Handsome fellow. He needs that book. Nice looking man over here. Nice looking people need Great Controversy. Say amen. Mm-hmm. Get him one. She said, Satan's most effective agents are people whom you'd never suspect. They are respectable in the church in the community as i said well-mannered well-spoken educated cultured can tell you who painted that painting as opposed to who painted this one but they are agents 
of the devil. Meaning that to be an agent of the devil, you need not have your eyes roll back into your head and foam at the mouth. You just have to be one who attempts to serve God part-time and serve the devil part-time. You are effectively serving the enemy full-time. No man, I don't care who you are, can serve two masters. But I repeat, 20 minutes to 8, most Christians try to do it. Because if I say in my heart, I am not 100% the child of God, who has the other percentage that God doesn't have? And since God does not share... Who has me? Every person not wholly committed to Christ is under the influence of another power. Let me repeat that with great respect. Every man or woman, whether seated here or standing in the pulpit, not fully committed to Christ is under the power, the control of another power. And there are only two powers in the universe. One has a very short longevity. It's coming to an end quickly. No man, Matthew 6, 24, can serve two masters. Now here is the attitude Jesus wants from you and me. Notice the wording he uses. For either, either means how many are involved. Two. Two. For either he will hate the one and, what's the word? Love the other. What do you call those two words? Opposites. Extremes, fine. <laughs> Opposites. Now, when you and I are confronted with opposites, there is no guesswork in opposites. In other words, if I love God, that's one extreme. And I hate the devil. That's another extreme. My love for God will become very evident. But if some people or if your neighbors, your, your, your church members, your colleagues are not sure if you're Christian, we have got a problem. And God is not morally obligated to take care of you. Because you're not his. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon, says Jesus Christ, who is the word, the truth. But I repeat with respect, many of us try. And that trial can end before we leave here tonight. Now, if your treasures are being stored up in heaven, verses 19 through 21, if your eye is single to God's glory, verses 22 and 23, and if you are serving one master, Jesus Christ, verse 24, if these things are in place, then verse 25 makes sense to you and to me. Therefore I say unto you, because of these, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Don't worry. People just read verse 25 and forget 21 through 24. The word therefore in 25 connects it with what went before. So Jesus is saying, if your focus is heaven, if your eyes are single to my glory, if I am the only master you serve, then don't worry. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? In other words, there's more to life than the physical. There is something more important. That's what Jesus is saying. But too many of us, we act as though the physical is more important than the spiritual. Jesus says that's wrong. Verse 26. 
Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Look at the wording of Jesus Christ. He says, your heavenly Father feedeth them. He does not say, their heavenly Father feedeth them. And that's deliberate. It stresses a point, which is this. If your father will feed that which is not his child, hmm, will he not feed you? Yes, God created the birds. But he never died for the birds. They weren't made in his image. In that sense and to that degree, he is not the father of the birds. He is our father. And notice the words, are ye not much better than they? In the eyes of God, you and I are here. The birds are here. Let me say that again. The Bible gives clear instructions to treat animals kindly. But the Bible is also clear we are of more value in God's eyes than many sparrows. Now, if notice Christ's word, are ye not much more? How much is much more? It sounds gargantuan and gigantic to me. Tremendous difference. Now, Jesus says, if my father cares for a living organism that far down the totem pole of importance, and you are at the top of that pole, what right do you have to worry? Don't you understand? Jesus says, when you worry, you make me look bad because the, the angels of uh, the fallen angels, other intelligences perhaps look around and they say, well, why is he worrying? What kind of father does he have? It is a sin to worry. Go ahead and throw whatever you want to throw at me. It is a sin to worry. If you're a child of God, if you belong to the world, that's what you ought to do. Am I being too harsh? No? All right. Which of you, verse 27, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. A blade of grass, a flower, was more gloriously arrayed than Solomon in his finest regalia. Why? Because God dressed it. Don't you see what Jesus is doing to his children? He is pointing them to the great creator. Behold the fowls of the air. They were made on day five. Genesis 1.20 And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Jesus says, he who made the fowls and sustains what he makes will take care of you. Then he says, Consider the lilies of the field. Then in verse 30 says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, well, the lilies of the grass, they were made on the third day of creation. Genesis 1.11, the Bible says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass. He is pointing them to the Creator. You see, we've got to connect salvation with creation. And the God who said, Let there be light. The God who said, Let the earth bring forth grass. God who said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life is the same God that will provide and he provides the same way by his word, his divine fiat, his spoken command. When God commands that you'll be taken care of, you will be taken care of and I. But the key is, how many masters are we serving?
we have to serve one. I recommend the creative heaven and earth. Based on scripture, first of all, and my personal experience and countless testimonies I have heard. The child of God should not worry. Let me show you how Jesus contrasts what our behavior should be with those in the world. Verse 30 says of Matthew 6, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, in other words, the grass comes up and it's gone, and Jesus still cares, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31, Wherefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do whom? The Gentiles seek. Or Luke twelve thirty says, The nations of the world. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of what? How many things? All. God knows. I believe... And the scripture seems to support it. We find ourselves begging God for a lot of things. Because somewhere in us, because of our divided loyalties, we don't expect the bountiful blessings of God. Jesus says, your heavenly father knows that you need. All these things. He knows it. You don't have to beg. He knows it. Verse 33. Now notice he uses the word seek. For after all these things do the Gentiles do what? Seek. Now there's nothing wrong with seeking the problem is in what order we seek we shall see the word seek again verse 33 but what seek ye what first why does jesus use the word first becomes it comes ahead of seeking what food clothing all the other things he listed that he knows we need. He says, seek the kingdom first. That is the chronology a child of God follows. Step by step. The kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Now, what do the Gentiles seek first? The things for physical living. Jesus says, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. So Jesus expects the Gentile to be seeking and the child of God to be seeking. Now here comes a, a being from Pluto. And he's observing Gentiles seeking and he's observing Christians seeking. There ought to be a difference in the seeking. The child of God seeks the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so this alien watches this group, the children of God, and he notices they seek differently. Then he watches this group and they seek differently and he understands there is an ocean of difference in the seeking. If we would follow the chronology Jesus lays down in Matthew 6.33, with all our hearts. Having established clearly, verse 24, we're serving one master. Worry and fear, anxiety, uncertainty would evaporate from our lives. When God sent the manna in the wilderness, how much manna did he send for Tuesday? Enough for what? Tuesday. How much did he send for Sunday? Enough for Sunday. What does that tell you? How should we live? One day at a time. Now let me ask you this. 
can God feed you for just one day? Yes. Can the Salvation Army feed you for one day? Yes. Can I, in a fit of generosity, give you a sandwich for one day? Yes. But you ask someone to do it for you 50 years, you may get what? 50 years? Hmm. But that's how we live. You look at a man who's been smoking 40 years and we tell him, can you give it up for the rest of your life? Can you give it up today? Just for today. That's all. Who told you you have the rest of your life? Do you have a receipt? And so Jesus says in verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't worry. Listen, God does not give you any blessing on Sunday night to be used for Monday. I can wait until 8.30 for what I'm waiting for. Amen. <laughs> you really treat me badly, you know that. Let me repeat, God does not give a blessing on Sunday that you need for Monday. The blessing you get on Sunday is for Sunday. Because God may decide to take your life on Monday or Sunday night. It's one day at a time. Now you may plan for tomorrow. But live for today. Let me say that again. You can plan for tomorrow. But live for today. Because today is all we have. And so Jesus says, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That's it. How do you seek it? How do you seek it? How do you seek it? Tell someone about Jesus. How do you seek it? Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God. There's something in me I don't even know exists. But since I am me, there must be something in me. You search, find it, dig it out. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I didn't promise to let you out at 8. Can you give me until 5 after? Can you do that? All right, that's all I need. And all these things shall be added unto you. All. The verse didn't say if you ask. They will simply be added. If we seek the kingdom first, God just gives us certain things. Because He knows... If he gives, then we keep seeking the kingdom. If he does not give, we stop seeking the kingdom to go get them. I am not spiritualizing our temporal responsibilities. You work for a bank tomorrow, go to work. You work cleaning the street, go clean it. But in the cleaning of the street... You can seek the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In working at the bank, you can seek the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In your professorial role, you can seek the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because there is no time, however microscopic, when the child of God can say, Well, this is mine, and I won't try to be like God. Because that's all the time the devil needs. Because he works fast. And so I say to you from my heart as we close... God will take care of us. But our focus must be heavenly. We are too concerned with that which is secular. And we are riddled with uncertainties and doubt and crises that are entirely unnecessary if we would only redirect our focus and put it on heavenly things where there is certainty. I mean certainty. 
Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I have to ask you, if I didn't ask you, I'd be responsible to God. I must ask you, have you been seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness? I cannot read your heart, you cannot read mine, and I'm glad for that, and I'm sure you're glad for that. But God can. Our hearts are open books. As you and I sit where we sit and stand where we stand, if God showed up and stood in your face and mine, and He can do that just by having you die tonight. I'm not trying to scare you. People, die, people are dying right now. They're being shot, dying from disease, dying of heart attacks, brain tumors, crime, old age, suicide. They are dying right now. Then why is God keeping us alive? Why? Is it possible He's giving us another chance to get right with Him? I have four minutes left. Is no one here tired of playing with God? Any man or woman who will say with me, Lord, give me the mind of Christ that I may seek your kingdom first. If you will say that with me, give me the mind of Christ that I will seek your kingdom first. Raise your right hand. Now don't, don't make me feel good. Raise it, leave it up. Stand up with me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I am one with my brothers and sisters who have sat before me and listened as I try to speak the words you've laid on my heart. Father, my prayer for them is my prayer for myself. We must be sure that we seek your kingdom first, always and only. Lord, if we are not wholly yours, we are under the control of another power. Help us to understand that. Dear God in heaven, let us reread Matthew 6, 24 even now. No man can serve two masters. Father, if there's a man or a woman who knows that he or she has been serving two masters, which ultimately is serving the wrong one. I pray in the name of Jesus, you would lay a conviction upon that person's heart so heavy, the person will have no rest until he or she decides to love Jesus and hate the enemy and hold on to Jesus and despise the enemy. Do this for us, I pray, please. Oh God, open our eyes to see that the time is short. The times are critical. And we must be sure, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, regardless of what the church does, family members do, as for me and my house must be our individual prayer. We will serve the Lord. Lord, let this be our song and our anthem that I as an individual will lay up treasures in heaven. My eye will be single to your glory and I will serve you and you alone that I may understand your words which say, take no thought for the morrow. Now bless my beloved spiritual family. Take them safely home and bring us back on Tuesday. But as we go, let your words sink through the soil of our minds down to the very subconscious and change us from that level. Hear us, I pray. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for His sake. Let all God's people say with me, Amen and Amen. God bless you.